you would, take your copy of God's Word and open with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, we're, we're going to be looking at almost all of the chapter, but we're not going to read all of it right here. We're going to start by reading verses 1 through 14, but don't, don't shut your Bibles when we finish reading them. Keep them open uh, because we'll be looking at the whole chapter. Matthew 24, verses 1 through 14. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness. The love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will will come. Father, we pray today that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The end is near. Used to be a phrase that we associated primarily with those sidewalk preachers. You know the ones I'm talking about. They had their place in the city and they had their sandwich board and simply declared, the end is near. Uh, It's amazing, however, that these days we hear that phrase uh, almost as often as simply the tagline of the latest movie out of Hollywood. I mean, movies like Oblivion, Bird Box, World War Z, and Quiet Place are all recent movies that have as their setting the near end or the end of the world. Video games like The Last of Us, Mad Max, Fallout 4 are are all video games that have to deal with how do we survive a world that has fallen apart. TV shows like Revolution, Doomsday Preppers, or even The Walking Dead keep audiences captivated with this idea, this discussion, this imagination of what the world will be like when it falls apart. Whether it's environmental disaster, a new super virus, anarchist, anarchist, or just old-fashioned zombies, uh, we seem to be uh, just captivated with this idea of the end of the world. Who knew Hollywood producers and apocalyptic preachers had so much in common? Have you ever wondered why we're so fascinated by the end of the world? I mean, why is it that we spend so much energy talking about and imagining what it will be like at the end of days? It could be, at least on Hollywood's side, that if you're talking about the end of the world, there is built-in suspense, right? You don't have to create suspense when you're talking about the end of the world. In Independence Day, when the aliens show up and they're ready to blast uh, the planet Earth to kingdom come, there's no worrying about whether or not the audience realizes the stakes. We understand the stakes. The stakes are high and we are paying attention. I mean, for most of us, this is probably why we find this entertaining, because it it has drama, it has excitement, it has suspense. To be honest, most of our lives are pretty routine, aren't they? I mean, if the the biggest excitement that you had last week was a game of Word with Friends on your iPhone, then, then, you know, escaping into the adrenaline rush of the latest zombie movie is probably, that's probably okay, right? It it just helps us just feel some excitement, even if our day-to-day lives don't have much excitement. The truth is, I think our captivation with the end of the world is more than simply this desire for excitement in our lives. I think deep down, perhaps even at a subconscious level, we, we look at the world around us and all of its brokenness. We, we see the troubles in the, the headlines. And, and there is something deep inside of us that is certainly aware of the fact that, that all that we think that feels so solid really could come crumbling to the ground 
we look around at our society and other people's uh, communities around this planet, and, and there does seem to be cracks in the foundation. Jesus really, in his, this conversation with the disciples, re- really admits to us that our sneaking suspicions are correct. There are cracks in the foundation whether or not we can see them. The disciples didn't see them on that day. They, they are worshiping in the temple and they are leaving the temple grounds. And the, the, the disciples do what all of us do when we find ourselves in front of magnificent buildings. They, they just start saying things like, isn't it, isn't it glorious? Look how large it is. Look how big it is. And, and, and they would have been correct in doing so. At the time of Jesus' ministry, the the temple, this is the second temple, the one that Herod was primarily in charge of building, had been under construction for 50 years. You think the exchange at 610 and 59 is going to take a while. The temple had been under construction for 50 years. It was almost nearing completion. Josephus, the Jewish historian, wrote of this temple that the exterior wanted for absolutely nothing. That astounded the eye and the mind. He talked about if you happened to be in the right spot in Jerusalem when the sun came up over the hill, that you would have to turn your eye away from the temple because the reflection shone so brightly off of all the gold on the temple that you could not keep looking at it. He said, to approaching strangers, it appeared from a distance like a snow-clad mountain. For all that was not overlaid with gold was of purest white. Some of the largest stones of the temple were 40 feet long, 12 feet high, and 18 feet wide. All bright white in their appearance. The temple was more than simply a place to worship God. It was that. But for Herod and others in his day, the temple stood as a mighty accomplishment of what people can achieve. Jesus says to the disciples... As they marvel over the grandeur of the temple, he says to them, Do you see all of these things? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Jesus had the disciples' attention. I mean, like the zombie apocalypse movie, they knew right away that what Jesus was talking about was the end of the world. This was language that that for them and their day and age, they just understood that Jesus was talking about what was going to happen when the world came to an end. And when they heard this, their their immediate follow-up question is the question we all have when we hear that the end is near, we say, how near? When will this happen? What, What date do we need to be prepared by? This is what we do when the doctor says there's, there's nothing more that we can do or the boss says to us, changes are coming. We find ourselves asking, when are those changes coming? And how will they affect me? The disciples, point blank, ask Jesus, when will this happen? And Jesus gives them, I'll just be honest, unsatisfactory details, okay? Jesus has a tendency to do that when we ask questions. We, we ask questions, and we want details, and we want a road map. And Jesus just has a way of, of redirecting our question in a way that, that, that he wants the discussion to go. And so he begins by giving them some details, but let's just be honest. These are pretty vague details. Look at verse 6. He says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. These will happen, earthquakes and famines later on in, in a couple of verses. He just describes in many ways the world. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I read through a lot of this, it just sounds like the headlines of every year of my life. So that whenever the latest war happens, or the rumor of war, or or some great famine or earthquake, the TV preachers do what? They pull out their charts, and they've conveniently updated those charts from the last time that they pulled them out. Uh, They're not so obvious as to just scratch it out and write a new name, but but they, you know, they they've obviously moved some things around, and they say, well, this is what we thought, but but now with this latest war, you know, they move this piece here, and then they have at the end of that map some kind of uh, of they don't give a specific date, but something that says now. Now we know when this will happen. And they've done that so many times, right, that you think we would have learned. This isn't just in our history when we've paid about it. You know, there was the book in 1988, 88 Reasons the Rapture Will Happen in 88. And, and, and we're still here. It didn't happen then as far as I'm, I'm, I'm aware. And, and, and every, every generation, every season has that. But you can go back throughout Christian history. Really, I mean, uh, from the moment Jesus ascended into heaven over and over again of people who thought they had figured out the date and what? They were wrong. 
which makes us think that we would stop trying to predict it, but, but still we have this impulse to know when. If we'd pay attention to Jesus' words, we'd realize that while he wants us to know something about the end, the calendar date is probably not what, what his primary point of this discussion is. In, in verse 6, again at the end of that, he talks about all of these signs that will happen. And he says, don't be afraid, these things must happen, but the end is not yet. In fact, further in verse 36, past beyond what, beyond what we read, he talks about how we simply don't know when the end will occur. He says, but on that day, about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So I just want you to know, if you ever hear a preacher tell you that he knows when the end of the world is going to happen, he is claiming to know more than Jesus claims to know, right? There's something wrong with that. And so don't listen to that preacher. Can we just say that out loud? At least on that matter. And, and, and the truth is, don't listen to Hollywood producers either if they tell you when they think and how they think the end of the world will happen. There, there's something more that Jesus is trying to pull out here. We want to know when because we're always trying to figure out where is the deadline for getting right. You know, we're like that. Uh, I, I'm like that. Uh, when Allison goes to visit her family, they live here now, so this doesn't happen as often, but used to, she would go visit her mom and dad occasion when I would have to preach. And I don't know what it is about what character flaw within my soul there is, but when Allison leaves, the house just sort of falls apart. And, and, and I would always send her a very loving text or, or give her a loving phone call, you know, and, and I would ask, when, when do you think you'll be back? Right? And part of that would be, I really love you, and I miss you, and I want you to be back. And another part of it would be, when was judgment day going to be, right, for the, the state of the house? And so I would know sometimes if she was coming back on Sunday afternoon, I might have to wrap this sermon up a little early so that I can get home and get things clean. Right? We want to know because we want to know perhaps how long, the other side of that is, how long can I put off getting right with God? And Jesus doesn't give us a deadline. Instead, he, he points us in a different direction, that, that he's wanting to bring us really to attention. Uh, first and foremost, that the greatest accomplishments of people will one day come crumbling down. It's something we don't often want to admit. We can forget that. The disciples forgot that. They're looking at this temple. They're, they're marveling at how grand it is. I'm sure that they thought that it would stand forever because, after all, this was God's building. Why would God let it come tumbling down? Even though he had already let a previous one come tumbling down, it's still this idea that sometimes we look around at some of the, the great things that people have built, and we think it will last forever. But Jesus is saying to us in this passage, the biggest buildings, the most exceptional countries, the largest of our financial portfolios, these will one day come to an end. The question is not so much, when will this happen? But rather, when this happens, what will be left of us? Right? When everything crumbles, will we? Jesus is really talking, about, to, talking to us about investing in the things that last, about, about investing our lives in a building project that, that will reach beyond the end of days. We know that in this life that, 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 that as long as things are going smoothly, we tend to think, think things are going to last. But when trouble starts to come, uh, all that once felt secure sometimes feels much less uh, uh, of a security. Notice Jesus' concern in verse 12. He says, because of the increase of wickedness, so he's talking about the end of days, when, when the world starts to come apart at the seams, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When things are going well in this life again, and things are running smoothly, it's easy to believe that we love each other, right? I mean, if everything's going well, our, our budget's up, you know, our programs are going well, it's easy to think, hey, we all get along, this is great. But, but just start to let the, the seams of society come apart a little bit and what begins to happen. Our politeness is exposed for what it is. It's often just a, 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 a surface 
kindness to one another that does not run deep. At the end of the day, we are always tempted to look after ourselves and our own. And when the world starts coming apart at the seams, Jesus is asking us, will you? That's what he's asking. When the world starts to fall apart, will you? Or will there be something deeper in your soul, something more substantial that lasts even beyond the breakdown of society? Jesus is challenging us this because he knows what is in the heart of man. He knows that when we are pressed, that when we feel threatened, that very often we will resort to our animal instincts, our basis instincts, which, friends, move us away from the kingdom of God. Honestly, that's what all those zombie movies are actually about. At least the good ones, right? You watch them, and, and I'm not much of a zombie movie person, I'll be honest, you know? I, it's mainly because just blood and guts, I start to go white, and, and you know, and yet I have a friend who loves them, and, and, and she talks about how these are great theological movies. And I'm like, really? Theological movies? And, and she says, yes, yes, because it's about when the world falls apart, Will you stick to your, your, your virtues? Will you stick to what you say you believe? Or will you do whatever it takes to stay alive? And Jesus is talking about that in this passage. He's talking about, you know, when, when the world comes apart at the seams, will you betray those you love? Will you betray your family members? Will you betray your friends? Will your love for others grow cold? And this is what all of those mo zombie movies are about. Uh, when the zombies show up, and I don't actually believe in zombies. We're using this as a metaphor, okay? So don't, don't write me an e email tomorrow, all right? That when the zombies show up in the TV shows, like, right? It, it's will I continue to love others or will I do whatever it takes to stay alive? Will I betray a friend if that's what it takes? Uh, will I murder if that's what it takes? W will I do all of those things that I said I would never do if, it, if that's what it takes to save my own skin? And Jesus is saying when the end comes, even people who have professed their faith in Jesus, even people who claim to be followers of Jesus, many of them will give up on the ways of Jesus and resort to the ways of the world. At the end of the day, the best about all of these movies of the end of the world are really about when the end comes, will we lose ourselves? And if what it means to be ourselves, the people God has made us to be, and the people that God has redeemed us to be, I, I think th the most basic definition is that we become most fully human when we live out the two greatest commandments, to love God with all that we have and to love our neighbors as ourselves. What Jesus is saying is that is who I have redeemed you to be. And when the end comes, be warned, there will be those whose love grows cold because they will be afraid that love, the love of God and the love of neighbor will not be enough, will not keep them alive. And Jesus is warning us against that. And, and it's, I don't think so much that Jesus is saying that, that all Christians will suddenly be swayed by the devil's schemes. As I think he is saying that at the end, in those seasons of great pressure, that very often what will happen is that the pressure itself will reveal status of our souls, R really what we have been all along, but, but whether or not what we claim to be is really on the surface or whether it runs so deep. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 3. He said, if anyone builds on, on this foundation of Christ, he says, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their w work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but will yet be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Paul takes this a little different angle than Jesus, but basically he says our work in this life matters. What we spend our time and effort upon, it matters because at the end of our days, there, there will be a refining that the struggles of the, either the end of the world or the end of us, and I, I have bad news for you, one of the two of those are coming for you, right? 
you know, if we all make it to when Jesus returns, that will be the end for us. But friends, many of us will see an end before then. So here's the news. You may not have thought about it much, but the end is near in one way or another. And the question is, what of yours will last? Are you inv investing only in the things of this world that will one day be b uh, burned away? Are you investing in the kingdom of God? Think about what, what your desire is. What, is. what is the desire of your heart? Do you want to be the very best athlete in the world? Or do you want to be a faithful follower of Jesus? Are you deepening your pockets? Or are you deepening your soul? Are you prepping for the end by stockpiling, I, I don't know, smoked salmon in your pantry? Or, or, or are you preparing for the end by cultivating a love that will endure? Don't hear me wrong. Work is not bad. We all have to go to work. We all have to do things that matter in this life, in the here and now. I love Martin Luther's response one time when someone asked him, if you knew the end was tomorrow, what would you do? And he said, I would plant a tree. What he meant by that was God calls us to be creatures living on this planet. And so we are always to work for the good of our neighbors today. That is faithfulness. And faithfulness involves going to work and, and doing your job well. And, and it involves in some ways planning for tomorrow. But friends, all of that work is supposed to serve the larger work of God's really saving and sanctifying work in your soul. That everything we do is, to, is supposed to be the medium by which God is transforming us into the image of Christ. And so that what will last, again, what will last is not your retirement account. Some of you are already saying, <laughs> it's already gone, Pastor. Right? It's not going to last. I don't care how much money you put there. It's not going to last. The buildings you build will not last. The careers you build, they will not last. There will be a day when they will be remembered no more. But friends, the character of your soul matters. Matters. Because that is what will last. Hear me well, it's not so much that we have to work our character in such a way as it will last. Because friends, this is not primarily our work. It is primarily God's work. But God invites us to be partners in that work. And the question is, every day, are we allowing to do God to do a work in us that will last? So that when the end comes, the quality of our soul will reveal itself. Not because we've done good work, but because we have been submissive to God's good work in us. I've seen this in heroes of the faith in, in my life who have experienced the end. You know, we, we always talk about the end of the world, but the truth is the end of the world is near for all of us. Jesus may not come back for a thousand years, but friends, our end is near. We are human beings. We have limited amount of time on this planet. And I remember reading the work of one of my, my professors at seminary, the late A.J. Conyers. And he wrote a book on really the, pat, the Mark 13, which is the parallel passage in Mark's gospel about this. It's called The End, what Jesus really said about end times. And he talked about the fact that as long as we keep the end, the discussion of the end, only about some remote future, we, we really miss the fact that every day what we do affects the end. That really the only point at which you and I can impact eternity is right now, right? I can't, I can't rewind and do yesterday different. I can't fast forward to tomorrow. The only day I can make a difference about eternity is today. And we do that by making the decisions today that submit our lives to God's will so that our very souls are shaped every day more and more into the image of Christ. And he says we do that. By, by putting our faith in Jesus, by obeying Christ. He talks about it's when we care for the poor man in our midst, the starving child in our community, the prisoner in our institutions, the very humblest and meanest of those who enter our lives today is in fact the way we greet the last moment of our lives. Did you hear that? That the way we love the meanest and the most needy in our lives today is the way we greet the end. Because those are the things that last. Those moments of obedience and faith. What was true in Dr. Conyers' writing was true in his life. It was during seminary that he was diagnosed with a cancer that could not be cured. 
He continued to teach faithfully as long as he could, you know, showing up, investing in the lives of his students, even though he knew that his end was near. And he wrote a letter to his friends and his students as, as his death was really imminent. And he says, troubled times have this virtue. They drive us outside of ourselves. During this season, I've asked very basic questions of God, and I have got what I have taken to be answers. I was driven ever deeper into a desperate search for a place to stand. What a great line. That when everything around us begins to crumble, we find ourselves in a desperate search for a place to stand. And he says, once I was terrified of cancer, but no longer. And if being thrown back on providence means learning to trust God amidst even our greatest fears, then it is that very providence that fears us from the bondage of dread and panic. Fear not, I am with thee. These are the words that bind us to a destiny, even while they free us to live without fear. Friends, I've watched not just Dr. Conyers, but other saints meet their end. And those who have put their faith in Jesus, who, who have allowed Jesus to do his work in their lives every day, it doesn't mean they, they don't have nervousness about what death will feel like. It doesn't mean they don't have some kinds of fears. But it, but it does mean that even at the end of their days, as everything in their life, their very bodies no longer become a safe place to stand, they find a secure footing. And they find a secure, secure footing in one place, and that place is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. Friends, I'll just be honest. I don't know when the end of the world is. Just, you don't even have to ask me. I don't know, right? I don't even know exactly what it will be like. Don't trust, again, any preacher that tells you they do. But I do know that the day is coming for all of us when we will meet our end. When either the world or our world will fall apart. The question on that day is really not how or when the end comes. The question is, when the end comes, will it be the end of you? Let us put our faith in God. The one who has overcome the grave. The one who promises to be our secure place to stand. Even when this whole world falls apart. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we are so grateful that you hold us in your hands. We are so grateful that your saving work in us is a saving work that's meant to last. That, that Lord, you of all people, you, you know the end is coming. You, you actually know when it is coming. And your rescue plan is to save us from that day. Lord, to put us safely within your very presence so, so that, Lord, when the world falls apart, we don't. Not because of our own efforts, but because of what you are doing in our lives. So, Lord, help that great truth motivate us, compel us, embolden us to live faithfully today. Lord, when, when things that cause us fear begin to threaten our lives, when we are threatened to abandon the ways of Christ because we, we somehow think that selfishness will serve us better, Lord, help us to stand firm in you. Help us to stand firm in you by continuing to love our neighbors. And, and Lord, yes, even our enemies. Lord, help us to be a people who are patient and kind no matter what because we believe that this is your life at work in us. That, that it's, it's really the presence of Christ taking residence in our hearts. And so that, Lord, what we want more than anything else at the end of our days is to be able to say with confidence, I am with Jesus. And I will walk in his ways all of my days. Lord, we know we can't do that on our own. But we pray through the power of your spirit, you would help us to respond to your faithfulness with faithfulness of our own. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.